yeah okay um Okay, so this PowerPoint, I started today a little bit later because I am not going to lie, I was struggling trying to make this PowerPoint. Um, yeah, it was kind of hard to make the PowerPoint. It wasn't like a lot of concise like information, so I'm sorry if this is all over the place. But in all honesty, our first exam, and I'm pretty sure it'll be the same for you guys, our first exam was like mainly over growth and development and cardiac like over half the exam was like cardiac questions. So this PowerPoint's not the best, but hopefully it's like helpful enough to, you know, to be able to study. So there's another um, attendance link at the end. So if you did miss it, that's fine. It's, it's fine, it'll be put back up at the end. And do you guys have any questions so far, like before I get started over anything like you covered today in class? No. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with genetics first. Um, for this section, um, I can't, I don't really remember there being too many questions over it, but it's still good to go over. So genetics is basically mainly definition. So genes are segments of the DNA which direct which kinds of proteins are made by the cells. Genes have DNA to code for one protein. And um, I got most of this information from my blueprint because I didn't get sent your all's PowerPoints until like last night. So most of the stuff is from my blueprint from um, spring. So a genotype is a makeup of specific genes at a certain locus. Phenotype, the outward appearance of the individual based on the genotype in the environment. And then a karyotype is the ordered display of chromosomes. So 46XX or 46XY, things like that. A genome is a complete set of genetic information stored in the chromosomes of DNA. And then genetics is the study of individual genes and disorders associated with the abnormal. You have to wonder if they test a large group of people that look normal or so they could find like the abnormalities. So, you know, that's kind of just what I just took whatever she put on her slide and I just copied it here. Um, genomics is a branch of molecular biology. It is a process of DNA sequencing and assembly to analyze structure and functions of the genomes. Transcription is the first step of gene expression, making an RNA copy of a DNA gene sequence. Translation is decoding the sequence of R mRNA into a sequence of amino acids as part of protein synthesis. Locus is where the gene is located. And an allele is a nucleotide sequence. It affects observ observable or oh my goodness, observable or dominant and affects hidden or recessive. So the different types of mutations. So in the box at the bottom, I put that chromosomal defects are like Turner syndrome or Down syndrome and mutations are gene defects. So these would be gene defects. So hereditary mutation is a chromosomal abnormality inherited from a parent. It's present throughout the life and can also be called germline mutations. It's present in every cell of the body as, as inherited when the fertilized egg receives DNA from both parents. Acquired or somatic mutation is insertion or deletion of one or more base pairs in the DNA molecule. It happens to some of the cells, but not all of them. It may be caused by an environmental factor like UV rays from light. Errors in DNA copies during cell division Somatic mutations happen in some cells, but not in others. And then de novo mutations are new mutations that can be inherited or somatic, and it can occur in a person's sperm cells or egg cells or after fertilization of the embryo. So the different causes of disorders. Trisomy is three copies of one chromosome. Monosomy is one copy of one chromosome, which is lethal. And non-disjunction, Humologous chromosomes do not separate normally after meiosis or mitosis. Deletions are loss of DNA, and duplications are extra DNA. Inversions are positive effect. They have two breaks on a chromosome, and the pieces are put back together backwards. 
translocations are interchanging of genetic material between the non homologous chromosomes. And then the take home message at the bottom is just loss of gen genetic material is way more like it's way more serious than a duplication. Like duplications like trisomy 21, like Down syndrome. I mean, it's still like serious, but you won't die from having Down syndrome. So the different dysmorphic features, so microcephaly or macrocephaly, micro, small, macro, large. So microcephaly, small head, macrocephaly, large head, triangular shaped face, large forehead with a small chin. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Hypo or hypertellurism, either the eyes are too far apart or too close together. And low set ears, I remember there being a question about low set ears, so kind of highlight that in your notes. It's a sign of developmental delay, so the ears should line up with the eyes. Sometimes um, we'll see low set ears with the pinna folded or the ears are rotated backwards. So any child with a de developmental delay in dysmorphic features needs an immediate referral to genetics. And I remember that specifically was on the exam. So try and highlight that somewhere in your notes, but I do remember her asking about asking about that specifically on our test. Oops, okay, short upper lip. So the distance between the lip and the underside of the no nose is short. A high arched palate is usually a sign of a genetic disorder, a button nose, low hairline, a webbed neck, which you'll, you can see that in Down syndrome, I believe, large tongue, and then the epicanthal folds, which is the skin fold in the inner aspect of the eyes, which makes it look like they have like, like kind of like the monolid, but they aren't Asian. So midline defects. Midline means that it's down the middle of the body, so in the middle of the child. So some midline defects are pituitary dysfunction, which affects hormones, and hypoglycemia, which isn't corrected by feeding, Heart, high arch pallor or cleft lip, tongue-tied or tongue-split, diaphragmatic hernia, congenital cardiac disorders, kidney dis defects, gastro gastrosis, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say that, and then gonadal defects. So Turner syndrome, sorry, it's kind of small. Um, so Turner syndrome is a female-only genetic disorder, so keep that in mind. Only females will get Turner syndrome. They'll have one X chromosome, or it's partially missing, or it's altered. So either one, they only have one, so it's not XX, or like half of it could be missing, or it could just be like skewed in their body. So these children can experience some characteristics or disorders, and it only occurs in about one in every 2,500 births. So they'll have a wide or web-like neck, those low set ears, which remember that could be a developmental delay, a higher narrow roof of the mouth, and then arms that turn outward at the elbows, fingers and toenails that are narrow and turned upward, swelling of the hands and feet, especially at birth, slightly smaller than average height at birth, slowed growth, cardiac defects, low hairline at the back of the head, receding or small lower jaw, and then short fingers and toes. And then this is just an example of like how they could present. So I'll just give you guys a second to look at it. So like, as you can see, like the webbing of the neck and then the low hairline in the back. And then they'll also have cardiac problems, but um, I'll go over that next week because y'all haven't talked about that yet. So we'll hit all the cardiac stuff next week. So Down syndrome is a genetic disorder when abnormal cell division results in an, extra, in an extra full or partial copy of chromosome 21, aka trisomy 21. And the biggest thing you need to remember about Down syndrome is they're at greater risk for septal wall defects. So emphasize that in your notes that they're at greater risk for septal wall defects. That's the main thing that you need to remember for Down syndrome. And then we'll go more in depth with it next week again, because we'll have examples of like the cardiac issues that they'll have. So Down syndrome, I'm pretty sure we've all seen like people with Down syndrome before. So we kind of know like what they look like, but here's just a list of the features that they'll have. So a flattened face, small head, short neck, protruding tongue, upward slanting eyelids, 
unusually shaped or small ears, poor muscle tone, broad, short hands with a single crease in the palm, relatively short fingers and small hands and feet, excessive flexibility, and they'll be shorter in height than um, normal people. So cystic fibrosis, um, I didn't go too in depth with this because it'll be covered more in depth in the respiratory unit. So I don't wanna put too much and then confuse you guys. So cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder that affects the way the body makes mucus. Mucus should be thin and slippery, but in patients with cystic fibrosis, it becomes thick, almost like glue and blocks tubes and ducts throughout your body. Over time, this mucus builds up inside the airways and makes it harder for them to breathe. The mucus traps germs and leads to infections and can also cause severe lung damage. So uh, cystic fibrosis is caused by mutation in a gene called CTFR, which controls the flow of salt and fluids in and out of your cells. If the CTFR gene doesn't work like it's supposed to, a sticky mucus builds up in the body and then leads to cystic fibrosis. So some characteristics of cystic fibrosis, they'll have trouble with bowel movements or frequent gassy stools, wheezing or trouble breathing, frequent lung infections, infertility, especially in men, trouble growing or gaining weight, and skin that tastes very salty. And salty kiss is like what she used on the exam. And I remember her specifically asking us a question about that. It was like cystic fibrosis, like, like how will you know that a uh, patient has cystic fibrosis and it was like salty kiss. So kind of emphasize that in your notes as well because I remember her asking us that. Are there any questions so far? Yes, so because they have that thick mucous membrane. No, just salty, salty kiss referring to the skin. So their skin will be like super salty. But on the test, she was just like salty kiss. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so the George syndrome. I don't know if she talked about this in class, but it was on our first exam. So I just added it just in case. So the, the George syndrome is a disorder caused when a small part of chromosome 22 is missing. This deletion results in the poor development of several body systems. So some things that a child with the George syndrome might have are heart murmur and bluish skin due to poor circulation of oxygen rich blood as a result of a heart defect. They'll also have frequent infections. They'll have certain facial features like an underdeveloped chin, low set ears, and then remember again, that is indicative of developmental delay. Wide set eyes or a narrow groove in the upper lip, a gap in the roof of the mouth, aka a cleft palate or other problems with the palate, delayed growth, difficulty feeding, again, because that cleft palate, failure to gain weight or GI problems, breathing problems, poor muscle tone, delayed development such as delays in rolling over, sitting up, or other infant milestones, delayed speech development or nasal sounding speech, learning delays or disabilities, and behavior problems. So fetal alcohol syndrome, it's a condition in a child that results from alcohol exposure during the mother's pregnancy. So fetal alcohol syndrome causes brain damage and growth problems. So they'll have impairment of facial features, the heart, bones, and the central nervous, the central nervous system may occur as a result of drinking during pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. So just remember that it's not a genetic syndrome, it's a genetic disorder caused by teratogens. I don't really know how to say that word, but that was a question on the exam. So what I put in red, emphasize that in your notes because she did ask us that.
So this is what um, children with fetal alcohol syndrome will kind of look like. So they'll have that low nasal bridge, the short flat mid face, um, a really thin upper lip, a small jaw, microcephaly, remember small head, the epicanthal folds, um, and then some small ear abnormalities. So are there any questions over genetics before I go to high-risk neonates? Again, like this isn't like the best PowerPoint because it was just hard to pull information like from her PowerPoints and then from my notes. But I didn't really have like a lot of notes on this stuff because our exam again was mostly like, I'm pretty sure your exam would be the same, but it was mostly growth and development and cardiac. So high-risk neonate. Um, so newborn screening. So hearing loss is the most common congenital abnormality. So newborns should be screened by one month of age. So make sure you remember that. So metabolic uh, screening. So they'll get the PKU screening. It's done a day or two after birth and it checks to see if their body can metabolize a protein called phenylalanine. Sorry, I just butchered that, but that's what PKU tests for. Um, hypothyroidism is the leading cause of mental disabilities in children, so that's why they always want to do that screening as well. Galactosemia, it checks to see if the baby is able to metabolize galactose in milk. And then they'll also screen for hemoglobinopathies. So newborn immunization guidelines. So the main immunization she focuses on is hepatitis. So it's a through dose series at um, birth, one to two months, and then six to 18 months. So if the mother is HPSAG negative, dose number one will be given within 24 hours of birth if the baby is medically stable and their weight is above 2000 grams. So they can't be a preemie, basically, if they're gonna get if the mother is HB sag negative and they need to get the, um, the first dose. So infants less than 2000 grams, their first dose will be chronological or adjusted at one month of age or before discharge. If the mother is HB sag positive, the hep B vaccine and hepatitis B immune globulin will be administered within 12 hours of birth. So when they're HBSAC positive, weight's not a factor because the infant's at higher risk. So for infants less than 2,000 grams, three additional doses of vaccine will be, will be started at one month, and then they'll be tested for HBSAC and anti-HBs at nine to 12 months. If the Hep B series is delayed, test one to two months after their last dose. So basically what I put in red is the most important thing for the slide. So if they're positive, if the mom is positive, they need to get it within 12 hours, and then weight's not a factor because they're at higher risk. So even if they are premature, they're still gonna get it anyway. And then just know when they need to be tested when the mother is positive. If the mother's HB status is unknown, again, it'll be given within 12 hours of birth regardless of the birth weight because they could be at higher risk because we don't know, like we don't wanna take the risk and not give it and then something like bad happens with the newborn. So you just wanna give it regardless. So for infants less than 2000 grams, HBIG in addition to Hep B vaccine within 12 hours of birth, and then administer those three additional doses beginning at one month. And then another really big important thing for this is you need to determine their, the mother's status like as soon as possible. So if the mother is HB SAG positive, administer HBIV to infants greater or equal to 2,000 grams as soon as possible, but no later than one week of age. So basically a big thing to remember for Hep B vaccines is just knowing 
what the mother's like status is. Like, are they positive? Are they negative? Or do we not know? So that's just a big thing to remember for these slides. APGAR, um, this is kind of like a review from OB, but I'll go ahead and go over it anyway. So APGAR score, so you wanna assess the newborn's immediate adjustment to life outside of the uterus. So the initial assessment has A, appearance, P, pulse, G, grimace, A, activity, and then R, respiration. So it's assessed at one minute and at five minutes and are repeated every five minutes until they stabilize. So eight to 10 means they're generally normal. So they won't need any interve intervention except to support the newborn spontaneous effort. Four to seven means they, they're having moderate, moderate difficulty outside the uterus. So they'll need to stimulate, rub the newborn's back, give them oxygen, and then rescore again at five minutes. And then if it's still the same, do it again at five minutes. And then if they have zero to three, that means the baby's in severe distress. So they'll need like full CPR resuscitation and everything like oxygen, all that stuff. And then again, we'll reassess it at five minutes. And then if it hasn't come up again, we'll keep doing every, all those things and then reassess it again in another five minutes. So there's no perfect score of 10 normally because baby's feet are always pretty blue. So most babies will be like an, a nine if they're healthy. Okay, so jaundice, I took this straight from her PowerPoint because this chart was like super helpful when I studied it. So physiolog physiological jaundice, you really do need to know the differences between physiological and pathological jaundice. Like this was definitely on the test. So physiological jaundice occurs after the second or third day and then pathological can happen at any time. So physiological jaundice, the babies will look normal, not anemic or not sick or anything, but pathological jaundice, they will look sick. Path pathological jaundice is a bad one and then physiological jaundice is like normal kind of. So on this slide, I just went a little more in depth with like the differences between pathological and physiological. So physiological jaundice and a healthy neonate jaundice can appear because of increased hemolysis and the immaturity of the liver to rapidly metabolize the bilirubin produced during the process. And like I said, it doesn't occur until the second or third day after birth. And then pathological jaundice is a result of an ongoing pathological process that interrupts the normal bilirubin metabolism. So it can occur at any time, even like as soon as the first hour after they're born. And what I put in the box below is I just took it from her PowerPoint. So unconjugated bilirubin builds up in the blood and causes jaundice. So it can pass the blood brain barrier. And if it's untreated, it could lead to like permanent brain damage or ultimately death. So if you see a baby with jaundice, you wanna treat it as soon as possible and like try to figure out was it physiological jaundice or was it pathological jaundice? Because if it was pathological jaundice, we need to act quicker. If it's physiological, it's not really that serious. So make sure you know the difference between the two because she'll probably ask you about it on the exam. So some important factors to assess in a high-risk neonate. So you wanna do the apnea and bradycardia, AKA the A's and B's. So apnea causes hypoxia, which leads to bradycardia. So if you fix the breathing, the bradycardia will fix itself. And I remember there being something like something along the lines of that on the exam. It wasn't this word for word, but make sure you know that for sure. You also wanna assess their level of consciousness and if they're floppy. You also need to know if they have, if the mom was GBS negative or positive, if they had herpes or anything with the nuchal cord. Also hypoglycemia, and you need to check if they're cyanotic. And GBS is a big thing because it could lead to sepsis and we don't wanna have any sepsis. So make sure you know Make sure you keep that in the back of your head as well. So some nursing considerations for isolate or radiant warmer. This was a question on our test. So that's why I just put it in here because it was on our first exam. So you wanna monitor the temperature before and then apply the patch and then never put any leads or any patches on the infant nipples because it could like rip them off. So that was a big thing that she emphasized for us. 
So just remember if you're putting any leads or anything or any like patches for warming on a baby, don't put it on their nipples. So ECMO, it's a treatment that uses a pump to circulate blood through an artificial lung back into the bloodstream. Basically just provides heart to lung bypass support outside the baby's body. ECMO is only used in like super, super sick babies that are waiting for a heart or lung transplant and provides them with enough oxygen so that it'll allow time for the lungs and heart to kind of rest and heal a little bit. So yeah, so ECMO is not like a common thing that's used. Like you'll only see ECMO used in like super, super sick babies that are like waiting for a new heart or a new lung. So necrotizing ent enterocolitis. So basically it's just death of tissue in the intestine, which occurs most often in premature or sick babies. So the nursing interventions are, you need to constantly watch them and also do those abdominal measurements before each feed and monitor the color of stool. Yes, I'm gonna upload these after um, tutoring's over because I know it's not gonna be a long session because there's not that much content to cover. But yes, I will upload these after we're done today. And then a big thing, no problem. A big thing, this was definitely, I like specifically remember this being a question on the exam because I knew it for sure. So the tomato soup, the tomato soup colored stool, that was like a huge thing that she emphasized for us. So remember for necrotizing enterocolitis, tomato soup colored stool. So put those two things together in your head and especially when you're studying, because it might be a question on your exam because it was definitely one on ours. It was probably like one of the first questions on our test. So neonatal brain hypoxia. So it's the most common cause of negative neurological outcome in newborns. Ischemia and hypoxia due to asphyxiation before, during, or after delivery. So the nuchal cord could be wrapped around their neck in utero. It could be pulled too tightly during contractions. The infant could be too large to deliver or, or they're like in a high risk area so they can't get good access to care for high risk deliveries or the provider didn't have enough experience. So like for infant too large to deliver, that could be like a mom with like gestational diabetes. So an LGA baby or like that, like the umbilical cord wrapped around the neck. I would know like you guys probably heard about that before. So just keep those things in mind. Those are what could cause like brain hypoxia in infants. So the torch infections, I'm pretty sure we kind of all remember this from OB. So these are the things like we want to teach like the mom to not do like this. This could be bad for the newborn, basically. So T for toxoplasmosis. So you want to teach the moms to not clean cat litter, like have somebody else do it. O for other, so hep B, parvovirus, fifth disease, HIV. Chicken pox, so rubella for R. C, cytomegalovirus, CMV and then herpes is H. So if the mom doesn't have any lesions, they can deliver vaginally, but if they do have lesions, they can't deliver vaginally because then it could pass on to the infant. So you also, you always wanna make sure like if you know the mom has herpes and they're going into labor, you need to do like that. You need to make that assessment and make sure there's no lesions. And if there are lesions, you need to like take the necessary precautions. So retinopathy of prematurity, or ROP, it's an eye disease that occurs most often in premature babies, and it causes abnormal blood vessels to grow in the retina and can lead to blindness. These vessels tend to leak or bleed, leading to scarring of the retina. When the scars shrink, they pull on the retina, which detaches it from the back of the eye, and this detachment is what will cause the blindness. So this is why you see like a lot of little kids with like glasses on because they're probably born premature and had ROP. So BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. 
is a form of chronic lung disease that affects premature newborns. And most often these newborns will need oxygen therapy. So in BPD, the lungs and the airways are damaged causing tissue destruction in the tiny air sacs of the lung. So the biggest thing you need to remember for BPD is keep the O2 stats within normal range for however old they are. And you need to keep close attention to pressure controlled ventilation. So that's the main thing you need to remember. Kind of just know like a general idea of what it is and then what you need to be doing as a nurse if you know that your infant has BPD. Sepsis. So sepsis is one of the biggest causes of like neonatal death especially if they're premature. So they could get sepsis because their skin, because remember like their skin is like super permeable. So, and they lose like a lot of like body heat, like super fast. So it can be caused by E. coli, listeria and some strains of streptococcus and GBS is a major cause of sepsis to newborns. So remember how I said earlier that you need to know like the mom has GBS. So it's preventable by treating the mom and doing the prenatal screenings. But if the mom is like homeless or they live in like a poor area, they probably won't be able to be screened as often. So we just need to take those extra precautions when we do know like if the baby has been exposed to GBS. And then the last thing is seizures. So for this slide, just keep it simple. So just know the causes. So hypoxia can cause seizures, sepsis, infection, hypoglycemia, narcotic withdrawal or a metabolic disorder. And the only thing that she really asked us for seizures that I can remember is to know the difference between a seizure and twitching. So if you hold the extremity and it stops moving, then you know the baby was twitching. And then if you can still feel movement after you're holding the extremity, then it's a seizure. So then at the bottom, I put here, if the baby has a seizure, you wanna check their vital signs and the blood glucose have another nurse call the doctor so you can monitor the baby because you don't want to leave a baby with a seizure because then you can have complications. And then you also want to time how long the seizure is. And if they're having multiple seizures, you need to time how long they are and how many they're having. So that was pretty much it for genetics and high-risk neonate. Like I said, she really emphasized on growth and development and cardiac for the first exam because there's so much on cardiac it's like super heavy so do you guys have anything like any questions over anything that y'all covered in class so far or anything that I talked about today like y'all can just ask I don't mind answering No problem. I will upload this for you guys. I'm sorry it wasn't that long today because it really wasn't like a lot for me to cover. But next week will probably be really long because cardiac is a lot. And I want to make sure you guys understand the cardiac lecture pretty well. So if you guys think of any questions that you have after um, or have later, just let me know. You can send me an email or shoot me a message on Facebook and I'll help you guys out. No problem. Thanks for coming today, guys. See you later.